Hello and welcome to week two, part one of EGM 703, Spectral Properties. In this lesson, we'll refresh our knowledge of spectral properties and discuss what, is, what it is that makes hyperspectral data so, well, hyper. Over the rest of this week's lecture, we'll cover a number of different methods of hyperspectral image analysis before looking at some different applications of hyperspectral remote sensing. Recall that the reflectance of an object, or the ratio of the energy that it reflects to the energy that falls on it, depends on its surface properties, such as roughness. It also depends on the chemical composition, or what molecules actually make up the surface, and also on the viewing angle and the angle of illumination. For example, leaves on healthy chlorophyll-producing plants absorb light in the red and blue visible wavelengths, leaving mostly green light to be reflected. As a result, most plants appear green to our eyes. We can also see absorption and transmission in action with the color of water. At the shore of the lake here, we see that the water is mostly clear, and as the depth increases, we see a shift in color to green and then very dark blue. Water molecules preferentially absorb longer wavelengths like red light, so the light that gets scattered back towards the sensor is at shorter and shorter wavelengths. As the water gets deeper, more of the light is absorbed, and so the water appears darker and darker because less of it is being reflected back. Scattering by suspended sediments and other particles also plays a role. Because most of the light that is transmitted into the water column is preferentially shorter wavelengths, the light that's scattered back appears more green and blue, again, depending on the depth. All of this is to say that objects or surfaces reflect differently at different wavelengths. Before we keep going, we have to lay out a few definitions. First, the spectral reflectance of an object or surface, rho sub lambda seen here, is the reflectance of an object for a given wavelength lambda. This is similar to how we define the spectral radiance or irradiance of an object as the radiance or irradiance for a given wavelength. The spectral signature of an object or surface is just the pattern of spectral reflectance across the electromagnetic spectrum. We can display an object's spectral signature as a spectral response curve, several examples of which are shown here. We see that in the visible wavelengths, these different plants, oak, lawn grass, conifer, all have very similar spectral signatures, perhaps at just different brightness levels. But the plants all look quite different to the concrete or the snow, which have somewhat similar reflectances across red, green, and blue wavelengths, meaning that they're going to appear gray or white or shades of gray or white. Moving into infrared wavelengths, we see that concrete has a fairly even reflectance, while the pattern of our different vegetation types is quite distinctive. We can also see that water has a very low reflectance across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So all of this means that we can use spectral signatures to help differentiate between surfaces and objects, potentially allowing us to map things like vegetation, or snow, or water bodies, or anything else we might be interested in. In order to use the spectral properties of different objects, though, we first have to measure those spectral properties. In the field, or in the lab, we use an instrument called a spectrometer. A spectrometer, seen here in action somewhere in Arizona, takes the incoming light and breaks it into its individual spectral components, similar to how a prism works. It then records the reflectance of the object at those different wavelengths. In other words, it, it records a bunch of spectral reflect reflectances. We often need to take multiple measurements of multiple surfaces or multiple samples, as even the same material can have a variable spectral signature. Remember again, the amount of energy that's reflected depends on surface properties as well as the illumination angle or the viewing angle. Instead of a field spectrometer, we can also use a hyperspectral camera. This is an instrument that records radiation in a large number of wavelengths. And of course, we will be talking more about this as we continue through this week's lecture. 
We can also use some satellite images, because some sensors record in a large number of wavelength ranges or bands. If we know exactly what we're looking at in a given image, we can use this information to estimate the object's spectral signature. In this course so far, we've primarily studied multispectral sensors. These are sensors with more than one band. For example, we've looked at a number of different Landsat centers, sensors, including the Multispectral Scanner, or MSS, the Thematic Mapper, Enhanced Thematic Mapper Plus, and so on. One characteristic of most multispectral systems is that the bands have a varied width. If we looked at the, at the band widths on this plot here, we see that they aren't all the same size. Not only that, but they also aren't continuous. There are gaps between successive bands where the sensor doesn't actually record data. Hyperspectral systems, on the other hand, are also known by another name, imaging spectrometers. They are characterized by narrow, continuous bands. Note that it's not necessarily the number of bands that makes a sensor hyperspectral, but rather the fact that the bands are typically of a uniform width and they are continuous. Some examples of hyperspectral sensors that we'll learn a bit more about are the Airborne Visible and Infrared Imaging Spectrometer, or AVARIS, or the Hyperion sensor carried by the Earth Observing One satellite. On the plot here, you can see the 220 bands of the sensor, which range from 357 nanometers all the way up to 2,576 nanometers in about 10 meter or 10 nanometer increments. If we take a minute to look at this plot here, we see a spectral signature for some type of vegetation. I think it was an oak leaf in black as well as what the Landsat 8 or 9 operational land imager and the Sentinel-2 multispectral imager sensors would see. These are the red and blue curves here. Note that the multispectral sensors capture the general shape of the curve, but there's a number of very pronounced absorption bands, for example here at about 1400 nanometers and at 1900 nanometers, that are missing from these curves. The coarse spectral resolution of multispectral sensors can make it significantly more difficult to, to correctly identify objects. If, on the other hand, we take a look at what a hyperspectral sensor sees, we see the difference, and we also see why hyperspectral sensors are called imaging spectrometers, because they record in many narrow, continuous bands. They are able to faithfully capture the spectral signature of these surfaces. Next up, we'll look at the characteristics of a few different hyperspectral systems. The first of these, the Airborne Imaging Spectrometer, records in 128 bands with a bandwidth of 9.3 nanometers. It operates in two different modes, a tree mode between 400 and 1200 nanometers and a rock mode between 1200 and 24 nanometer, 2400 nanometers. The reason for the names here is that for most vegetation, visible and near-infrared wavelengths are the most important for identification, while for rocks and minerals, it's often the shortwave infrared that is more useful. This sensor was typically flown at an altitude of about 4,200 meters, which gives it a ground sampling distance of about 8 meters. Next up, we have the Airborne Visible and Infrared Imaging Spectrometer, or AVARIS. You can see what this sensor looks like in the photo provided by NASA's Jet Pulsion Laboratory here. An example of one of the images taken by Avaris over Mauna Kea, Hawaii here. Avaris has 224 bands with a bandwidth of 9.6 nanometers, recording between 400 and 2450 nanometers. At a typical flying altitude of 20 kilometers, Avaris has a normal ground sampling distance of 20 meters. The Avaris homepage, linked here, has additional information about Avaris as well as access to the images that have been acquired by NASA during various flights. And finally, we will talk about the Earth Observing One Hyperion, which is a spaceborne hyperspectral sensor. As mentioned previously, it has 220 bands at about 10, 10 nanometers bandwidth and a similar spectral range as Avaris. It also has a 30 meter ground sampling distance, which is directly comparable to most Landsat bands. The example image shown here shows a hyper Hyperion scene acquired over Mount Fuji, Japan, 
alongside an artist's rendering of the EO-1 satellite. In this lesson, we've reviewed how we can use spectral properties and signatures to help identify or distinguish objects and surfaces using remote sensing. We discussed how hyperspectral systems work like spectrometers. They collect data in continuous, narrow bands, which means that we can use hyperspectral images to directly identify surfaces by comparing the data that we acquire to known spectral signatures. And finally, there are a number of hyperspectral sensors with data available for us to use, even if we don't have access to our own hyperspectral camera. You can read more about the topics we've discussed here in the textbooks, Lillisand, Kiefer, and Chipman, chapters 4.13 and 5.13, or Campbell and Wynn, chapter 2.6. I've also included a link to the Avarice homepage from NASA, which has additional information about not just Avarice, but also hyperspectral remote sensing more generally. This video from the National Ecological Observatory Network provides a good additional introduction to hyperspectral remote sensing. And finally, this article provides a good history and overview of hyperspectral remote sensing. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!